I'm going to ask you now to turn to Mark in chapter 4. And it says here in verse 36, When they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Psalm, please. Psalm 22. Again, this caught me by surprise because this was a passage I wanted to read. And wouldn't you know it, some of our younger friends here, they know the first eight verses of Psalm 22. That's what they've been learning in the last little while. I'm just going to read the first phrase of the first verse. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Isaiah 53, please. Isaiah 53. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. One translation has it as this, and with his stripes we are saved. May God bless to us what we have read together this evening. We've begun a new year. This is, this isn't the uh, first time to speak in this year, but it's the first time for me in Northern Ireland to preach the gospel this year. Last year, we were absolutely thrilled that many souls in Northern Ireland trusted the Savior. In fact, one of the last ones that I heard about, I was at the Belfast Conference on the 27th of December. And I saw a young woman starting to run down, run down the, uh, the street from the Europa Hotel to where we were standing. And, uh, I looked at her and I thought to myself, there's a, there's a young woman that has something to tell me. And I was absolutely thrilled. She's from Larne. And she's been listening to the gospel for a good number of years. In fact, I think she was even here some of the nights we preached here. And she just shouted my name and she says, I got saved. I said, when was that? She says, well, the day before Christmas Eve. I thought it wasn't that great. Four or five days earlier, another soul to Jesus board. I got saved. I said, I think I knew that. How do you know? I said about four seconds ago. I said, I think I was, I think I was wanting it. I I think I was wanting to hear that girl tell me that she'd got saved. So when I saw her smiling and running to down the street just a little bit quicker than usual, I thought, oh, she's got something to tell me. She's tell me she's saved. And she told me she was saved. Well, friend, I've got something to tell you. That the salvation that reached many a soul all last year is the same salvation that's available to you in 2024. And you can be saved. I love that last word. We are healed. We are saved. But 2024 hasn't begun in a very good way for a number of people. And so the emails that I'm getting out of Japan have been telling me of of three particular events that they are very saddened about, even right from the beginning of this year. One was an earthquake. The big earthquake that I've spoken often about, that was on the east coast of that big banana-shaped island of Japan. But this time it was on the west coast between Korea and Japan. And on the west coast, you've maybe seen some of the devastation. I'm glad to say that none of the believers that are in any of the assemblies in that area were adversely affected. But I tell you this, many were. And so the air, the earthquake that shook them up I tell you, they would want to know what it is when the, when the ground is shaking. You want to know, how can I be saved? And then we got the news the next day or so 
And one of my boys came to me very soberly and said, did you hear the news about the airplane crash at Haneda Airport? I said, "Where? what was that about? Well, a Coast Guard plane was sitting on the runway when a big plane came in from Sapporo. JAL Flight 516. I know that flight. And he looked at me and said, I'm glad we weren't on that plane. Now, what I found fascinating is 397 passengers got off in 90 seconds due to the strict training. And then the last people to get off were the cabin crew and the last person's the pilot. And they all got off the plane and it was raging already in flames. I'm telling you this, if I was on that plane and I have been on that flight, if I haven't been on that plane, there would only be one thing that I'd be thinking, how can I be saved? You say, well, it was a very good disciplined crew and everybody did exactly. I tell you, I know exactly how they would have done it. It would have been no mad screaming. It wouldn't have been no rushing for the, they would have all stood in a very orderly lines, exited exactly and down the slides. And you would say, we saved ourselves. Well, in a very real way. Yes, they saved themselves. How? By obeying the instructions. That's what they always say. In the event of an emergency, please follow the instructions of the cabin crew. And they did. And they were saved. Can I tell you that people are still being saved? I'm talking spiritually saved by following the instructions. Not the discipline, not the training of, of man's thinking, but following what God says. That's how people are being saved. There's no one who's ever saved except that they simply believed God. They believed what he said. I hardly know what to say about the third tragedy that heard Japan, hit Japan a short time later. I know a lot of the train stations in Tokyo. So when a woman went on a knifing spree, it's shaken the nation right to the core. And people are wondering... How can we be saved from these things? Traveling on a train, traveling on a plane, sitting in your own living room as the, as the ground begins to shake. There are things, and many of them are people are fatalistic about. They say, well, <laughs> you can't prevent it, so you just have to live through it. Friend, I want you to know that you can be saved, and there is a way of salvation. There is a way to escape hellfire. It's simply by obeying God. Listening to what he says. I want to speak to you about three storms. I've just given you three tragedies in Japan. And some people are there. They're so fatalistic. They're saying, we hope that's all the bad luck is now over. And now the good luck can start. Now, friend, being saved is nothing about luck, either good or bad. Being saved and knowing you're on your way to heaven is simply because of the grace of God that has brought salvation to us and we can receive it like a gift. And so I've told you about three stormy events in Japan. Well, let me tell you about three storms here that we've read that I see in the background. One of them's right in the foreground. I want to speak to you about the storm on the sea. Then I want to talk to you about the storm on the tree. And then I want you to be thinking about the storm within me. Because there was peace that was needed in that boat that was being shaken on the sea. And there was peace that was made by the storm that was on that tree. And there's peace that can be obtained even within me and within you. There's a peace that you can have tonight that maybe you never thought possible. Why did I think as that young woman was coming down the street in Belfast, why did, I, why did I immediately think that girl's got saved? Well, you say, there was a big halo around her. No, I'm sure she, knowing her personality, she's probably still a similar rascal to what she always was. I mean that respectfully. There was no halo around her. There was no personality change. But one thing she has now, she's got peace. All's well for eternity. All's well for eternity. Do you have that peace? 
Do you know that you're right with God? Do you know that if you put your head down on the pillow tonight and you never waken, that you're ready to meet God? That's true peace. Some of us have anxieties. Some of us are given to that, you know. Some of us aren't, maybe enough, but some of, some of us are given to anxiety. And some of us have a, have a, have a stomach that churns like a Bosch washing machine. And it goes around and around and around whenever you're uptight and whenever you've got, and some of us dream terrible things and, and you have all these anxieties. I know all of that, but there's one thing, friend, that I know. I know I'm right with God because Jesus Christ has made me right what he accomplished on that cross. That's all that really matters. That's all that really matters. Doesn't matter whether you're, I was thinking the other day about, uh, I love bridges. Went over the Firth of Forth Bridge over there in Scotland recently and I had came up on my computer, a lovely picture of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and, and there's all these different bridges and I like, you know that there's some people and they cross the bridge and they cross bridges with great confidence they stride across and they can jump on them and feel. And then there's other people and they're just quite a bit nervous and they just are a little bit now. Is this bridge is, you know, it's, it's a before long ways down. And of course it's a long ways down. That's why they've got a bridge there is to get over the place. The person that is very confident and the person that's very nervous. Could I just point out to you? It's not their personality and it's not their nerves and everything that either saves them or condemns them. It's the strength of the bridge that holds them up. And some of you might be very nervous and you're just all wondering about the future and you get all, all upset and that. Could I just tell you this? It doesn't matter about being fearful and being anxious and what really matters is that you have the strength of the Savior to save your soul. It all depends on him. And there's some people who have said this. They said, I trusted Christ and never had another doubt that for the rest of my life. All I can say is God bless them. I've had bad days. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad that my salvation depends upon Jesus Christ, who never changes. And it doesn't depend on the nervous state or the anxious state that I might be in. I'm saved because Christ saved me. I'm saved because I'm in the grip of his grace. I just say that in passing. It's not, you know, salvation really doesn't depend on you at all. It's just when a soul simply depends on Christ and he saves. You see this storm here. What I'm so glad about the storm on the sea is that the disciples knew exactly where to go. I was trying to point out to the children, do you think it was strange now that the Lord Jesus was fast asleep? I said, life is like that. Life is like that, that right in your deepest hour, you wonder, where is God? Let me tell you where he is. He's in perfect control and he's there and he always is. I tried to tell them that the, the Lord Jesus was, was actually asleep, but he was in a very interesting place as he slept. He wasn't down in the front of the ship with a big fluffy pillow. We, we get that impression that there was a nice big down filled pillow. Uh, it's not that at all. In fact, it might even be better translated that he was asleep and his head was on the headrest. There was only one place. There was only one place where there was any, it was a thing called a pillow. It was where the man sat who had his hand on the rudder. I don't understand why the Lord Jesus was sitting there, but it certainly is indicative of this. Even though he was fast asleep, he was still in full control of where they were going. I love that about God. You know, God never slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord Jesus is a real man and he did sleep and we do know that. But there's a delightful thing to think of where he is even when he was sleeping. And when they went to someone for help, who did they go to? They went to Christ. And I would like to remind you that if you want to be saved, you want to know you're on your way to heaven. I'm deliberately using the word saved over and over again because it's a good biblical word. It's a word that is just entrenched in scripture. It's a word that can be translated delivered. It's a word that can be translated healed. It's a word that I thrills my heart. You can be saved. Well, if you want to be saved, where are you going to go to get salvation? I trust there's no one here that 
is neglecting this salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And this salvation is available to those who go to Christ to get it. It's not available to those who just sit back and neglect and those who just wait for it to fall on them from heaven. This salvation is what the Lord Jesus described. He says, you strive to enter in. He says, what you're going to have to do is make sure that you personally go to Christ for it. I tell you, Christ has already come to you. He's come to you and he's come to me and he's come to die on the cross for us. But you make sure that you go to him. There was a day when a man approached the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus looked at him and loved him. He must have been a fine, upstanding gentleman in the community. He was a young man. He had great potential. He was a rich man. Great resources. And when he came to the Lord Jesus, he was asking the right questions. How do I inherit eternal life? And the Lord Jesus put it to him in such a way that he had to make a choice between the riches of this world and following Christ. And it says that the young man went away sorrowing. He wasn't the only one sorrowing. The Lord Jesus who loved him, let him walk away. The Lord Jesus who loved him, let him walk away from salvation. Because this salvation is not forced upon a man from God. This salvation is the man. The man yielding his will to God. And the reason why you are not saved tonight is not because there's anything on the problem of God. The problem is you. You've never come and yielded. You've never repented of your sin. You've never bowed your will. Maybe you've come to God on your own terms. If you do this, then I'll believe you. God says, you believe me and I'll do this. God wants you to yield your will. Well, these people, they got to Christ and they went to, I wonder if there's a young friend of ours here tonight. Maybe there's an older one and you have never yielded your will. You've never got to Christ. You've never come and cried to him for salvation because when you cry to someone, what you're doing is you're saying, save me. I trust you. You are my hope. You are the one who can save me. And you've never to this point in your life, you've never turned to Christ for salvation. These disciples got to Christ. And they challenged whether or not that he cared for them. Master, carest thou not that we perish? What an interesting word this word perish is. They were talking about perishing and becoming fish food. No. Whenever we come to the Bible, we read that perishing is a soul that goes out into eternity without Christ and without hope. And we read that perishing is going down to the, down to hell and ultimately the lake of fire. And to perish is the most horrible thing that can happen to a human soul. And let me tell you this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him, get these words, should not perish. You associate God so loved with should not perish. Master, carest thou not that we perish? There was one person on earth who cared more for them than they could ever understand. Carest thou not that we perish? And the Lord Jesus, he looks at them and then he looks at the wind. He looks at the, at the waves and he just stands up and he just rebukes them. He rebukes the whole source of the trouble. I see the devil behind that storm. I think that was a storm deliberately brought about, used of satanic power to try to sink the Son of God. And the Lord Jesus stands up and rebukes. You don't rebuke inanimate objects. He rebukes the wind. The sea suddenly becomes calm. I'm not going to shout it out. I did that in the Sunday school. Peace. Listen to that word, would you? This is a command from the Son of God to show that he has power over nature, but I would love it if someone could understand that there's a word that comes from Christ 
And it's not just to calm the troubled wind and the, and the sea, but it's to calm the troubled soul. Peace. Peace, be still. They were stunned. The wind stopped. The waves stopped. There was a calm that they'd, just as the storm was worse maybe than they'd seen in a long time, there was a calm that came when they needed it most. That's what the Lord Jesus can do for you. If you have a storm that's within your heart right now because of your sin, let me tell you this, the Lord Jesus is the one who's able to bring a calm when you need it the most. And it's my prayer right now that there's a storm that is brewing in your heart that is far worse than the storm on Galilean Sea. But there'll be a storm, there'll be a wrestling, there'll be a convicting of sin. But not everyone who realizes their sin is saved, you know. The reason I say that is that it's not a million miles away from here, just in another town. When John Rogers and I were here, we visited that man a number of times. And he told me he had enough sin that if the records were truly kept, it would have filled his entire room with police files. I believed him. And I don't know what happened in his final moments. But I do know that when I left him the last time, he could speak about his sin, but he could not speak about the Savior. The solemn reality is this. The Lord Jesus is the one who can bring you peace and brought peace to that storm on the sea. But you're going to have to get to Christ if you're going to have that peace. And I fear that this is the one problem that some of you have, that you know that there's the love of Christ, you know that there's the death of Christ, you know there's the resurrection of Christ, and you know that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, but you've never got to Christ. You've never taken that step that goes to Christ and says, save me. You've never taken that step of complete and total repentance and uh, and yielding uh, and trusting. Trusting. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a trusting of Christ. It's not believing all about him. The devils believe and tremble. They know all about him better than you do. But they're not trusting him. And God is calling us to trust the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. So that storm on the sea really tells us more about a storm within me. But let me let me come to Psalm 22 briefly. There was an awful storm that broke that was far worse than Galilee. It was Calvary. And a storm broke upon the holy soul of Christ, such as you and I will never be able to understand. Talks about waves. The psalmist speaks about waves and billows have gone over me. And the Lamentations speak about fire descending and coming into my bones. Whether the imagery is water and a storm. Have you ever seen a firestorm? Have you ever seen a firestorm? Devouring. Intense. Whether it was a water storm or a fire storm. Those are only images that help us understand the storm on the cross. When Christ was made to answer for crimes he hadn't committed. When he was called upon to receive a penalty for sins that he'd never done. When he steps in that breach between God's holy throne and the sinful convict. It's called a mediator. He comes in between and he bears his soul to the awful wrath. And he provides an umbrella of safety to those that are guilty. He's come between, friend. In fact, the Bible speaks about a shipwreck that the Apostle Paul was on. And he endured. And they came to a particular place just outside the Isle of Malta. And it says where two seas met. 
And it's just right there that it was the most violent. And it ripped that ship apart. 276 find themselves floundering in the water. It was such the force our two seas met. Reminds me of the cross. When God's terrible judgment against sin meets the sinless soul of Christ. When truth meets grace, when justice meets mercy, when God's holiness meets the love of the Savior, I tell you, this is where two seas collide. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other, says the scripture. It was there that he was chastised for our peace. That's what that means. The chastisement of our peace. If you just make that of into a four, maybe we'll help you understand. The chastisement for our peace is laid upon him. That's where it meant. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He is made to answer the chastisement. That's what we deserve as sinners. And he, it falls upon him so that it brings us peace. He becomes a substitute. He becomes answerable in that storm of God's wrath. You say, where's the peace? I'll tell you this. Peace never arrived until the Savior had endured it all. So the storm had spent its last. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's the only one who should never have had the fellowship broken. He's the only one who never deserved to be banished from the presence of God. He's the only one who should never ever have to answer to anything that God's penalty and wrath would be against. He's the only one. So therefore the cry is, why me? I'll tell you why it was him is because he's the only one who was able to bear it. He's the only one who was able to suffer for our sins. He's the only one who could endure the storm. He's the only one who could go into it. He's the only one who could come out of it. The chastisement of our peace. Let me say this. If you have a storm within you right now, there's only one way that that storm can be calmed. It comes because of a word. It can be calmed because of a work. It's calmed like the way the Lord Jesus was able to calm the storm. And he was able to, with his almighty power, he's able to say, peace be still. And the Lord Jesus is still using his word to bring calm to troubled hearts. He brings calm to troubled hearts by giving them a promise, by giving them a word. And listen to promises like this. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. These are promises that can bring some calm to your troubled soul right now, troubled by sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Those are promises. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. I wonder if there's someone here who's going to be brave enough to admit that they're in a storm that they cannot calm. They have a problem that they cannot solve. They have sin that they cannot overcome. They have a hell fire that they cannot escape. And right now you're feeling hopelessly, helplessly, tragically lost. Can I tell you, friend, there is a work that the Lord Jesus accomplished for your salvation. There is something that has been done on the cross so that you can have your sins totally removed. And the penalty fell on him so that the punishment doesn't fall on you. 
And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you trust him. You trust him. You say, if I hang on to him, what if I let him go? I tell you this, you turn to Christ, he hangs on to you and he never lets you go. And you yield to him. And you'll find the one that calmed the storm on the sea and the one that endured the storm at the tree is the one that can bring peace to the storm within me. It's great to be saved. When I was in North America during the month of November in the United States having gospel meetings, they ended those gospel meetings and I was just able to fly to see my father, whom I hadn't seen for a while and some of my siblings that I hadn't seen in a decade. And we all met. He happened to be turning 80 that Sunday, so I got the timing right. I wonder what room they would put me in. There are different rooms in my parents' house. They still live in the same house. I wondered, would I get the nice big room downstairs with the fireplace? I, I mean, I'm the eldest. That one went to my brother. Oh. I, I wondered if I would get the big fancy Airbnb that my mother rented for all of us coming. Would I be over that? No, that, that one went to my sister. I, I wondered. They gave me a room on the northeast corner. Not a fancy room, but I'm so glad they gave me that room. Because when I sat down on the bed, I looked up. There used to be bunk beds in that room. That used to be the room that I shared with my brother. And as I sat on the bed, I looked up and I said, I was saved right there. I was saved on March 15th, 1979. There! And it flooded my soul to think that a holy, eternal transaction had taken place right in that little room. Oh, it was painted green back then. Mothers changed colors. Didn't change the place. Oh, the bunk beds are, I don't know where they are now. Firewood, maybe. I'm sitting on a fancy double bed now. But I was saved right there. Are you saved? Can you point to a place? Do you remember a moment when the storm was calmed and Christ became your Savior? Maybe someone will be able to, if the Lord tarries, they'll be able to come to Ballyclare Gospel Hall and say, I was saved right there. I was saved just, just over there. Uh, you say, is it a sacred spot? I tell you, friend. The spot itself doesn't matter. But being saved means everything. Are you saved? The one who calmed the storm on the sea the one who endured the storm on the tree is the one who can calm the storm within me. Will you not trust him? Believe on the Lord Jesus, what he's done on that cross for a poor sinner like yourself. You see, I believe him. The Bible says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. What a promise. Take it home with you. In fact, live with it and live for it and live upon it for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, we pray now in the name of the Lord Jesus that someone will get a grasp of who the Lord is and what he has done. And we pray, Father, that there will be something done for eternity in the hearts of those that have gathered. Refresh our own hearts, we pray with an understanding and a knowledge of the one who has died for us on the cross. And we pray that it might be like the dawning of a new day at the beginning of a year, in some dark soul, that they can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We'd ask thee to do thy, thine own unique work in the hearts of people. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.